The following program features archival footage from World War II. All of the images are real. Some are extremely graphic. Viewer discretion is advised. London, Paris, Warsaw, Berlin. It's difficult to imagine that these beautiful capital cities were once at the epicenter of war. As the opening salvos of World War II rang out in September 1939, no one could envisage the sheer scale of the devastation to come. In this film, we trace a line from the rise of Hitler to the invasion of Poland and the fall of France, with cities under siege and entire populations fleeing from total war. They understood the disaster much more through what they were seeing than from what they were reading or hearing on the radio. Featuring newsreel of the time, rare and enhanced archive footage, and the testimonies of those who were there. We heard the panning sound of the aircraft, and they started machine gunning, and I never ran as fast in my life. This is World War II, witness to war. Germany, January the 30th, 1933. It's been 15 years since Germany's disastrous and humiliating defeat in the Great War, and its economy has yet to recover. Now, Adolf Hitler and his Nazi party rise to power, pledging to restore pride to the German people. Living under the regulations of the Versailles Treaty, having lost one seventh of its population, it was promised we will be great again. But for Hitler, a new, more prosperous Germany is not enough. Nicht Deutschland, in uns marschiert Deutschland und hinter uns kommt Deutschland. His true intention is to create a mighty German Empire. On August the 2nd, 1934, Hitler assumes the title of Führer, putting him in complete control as Germany's outright leader. March 1939. Hitler's imperialist plans are set in motion. Having invaded the Sudetenland a year earlier, the remainder of Czechoslovakia becomes the new target. Next in line is Poland. Hitler knows, the Germans know, that they can't win a war if they fight in two directions at once. So Hitler forms a short-term pact. August the 23rd, 1939. The German-Soviet Non-Aggression Pact is signed. It pledges that there will be no acts of war between the two powers. It also includes a plan to divide a conquered Poland between German and Soviet rule. Now Hitler is ready to invade. Only one thing remains, to convince the German people that it's time to go to war. And millions of people had been soldiers in the First World War. They knew what was a war about. But on the other hand, it was Poland. And the German-Polish relationship after the First World War was very, very bad. The mood of the German people were becoming very anti-Polish. And the mood in Poland became very anti-German. So attacking Poland was something the Germans were not against. September the 1st, 1939. The German army, the Wehrmacht, marches into Poland unopposed and without a declaration of war.
mobile infantry units and panzer tank divisions storm across the border. While overhead, the Luftwaffe speeds toward its first targets. We heard the sound, humming sound of the aircraft. And um, everybody looked, and the first reaction was, oh, it's our, our aircraft. But as soon as they came close, and they started machine gunning, and I remember I ran, probably I've never run as fast in my life. Knowing that Germany is ill-equipped for a long, drawn-out war, Hitler relies on modern military technology and a new, deadly offensive tactic. Tens of thousands of square miles of territory shrink before the movement of lightning-armored columns. Poland and the world learn the meaning of a grim new word. Blitzkrieg. In the Second World War, planes and tanks are incredibly quick, incredibly sophisticated, and incredibly deadly. Germany's mobile armored units race through the countryside. The sheer speed and power of Blitzkrieg overwhelms the Polish army. It became obvious to me uh, that the German tactics were not advancing on the broad front not sending their Stukas ahead, bombing the enemy for hell on a short corridor, and then send the tanks through that. Poland's 34 million inhabitants, crushed, scattered, and enslaved. A desperate Poland looks to Great Britain for help. British Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain has done everything in his power to avoid war with Germany. But now the time has come to honor the Anglo-Polish agreement, which had been signed in March 1939 and promised assistance in the event of a German invasion. The British Expeditionary Force, the BEF, is sent to the Franco-Belgian border. At 9 a.m. on September the 3rd, Chamberlain gives Hitler an ultimatum. There's no response. And at 11.15, he makes his fateful broadcast to the nation. I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now, this country is at war with Germany. The British were reluctant to go to war again. But at the same time, I think people felt that Hitler was a real threat and very dangerous and had to be stopped. September the 8th, 1939. The mighty Wehrmacht reaches Poland's capital, Warsaw. With the hum of Luftwaffe bombers looming in the distance, residents realize there's no escaping the terror. Warsaw was surrounded by the German artillery. On top of the planes who were flying overhead and throwing bombs. And then they came over and they bombed and for the first time in my life, I saw the craters and uh, I thought how horrible it was, you know, what damage they do. And um, from then on, it was a daily occurrence of bombing. Under siege, Polish forces fight to defend the capital. When I saw the street, virtually houses on both sides completely destroyed, and then I believed War is here. The citizens of Warsaw struggle to survive the ruthless German barrage. It was hunger already, there was no water, there was no communication. And as a child, I was wishing that the war is over and I couldn't care less if the Germans come in or not because this, this, we were living in constant danger and constant fright. After 20 days of relentless battle, Warsaw is forced to face a new reality, German occupation. When the German armies finally marched into Warsaw, my life changed. 
180 degrees. The speed of events is astounding. With Europe still trying to recover from the Great War, Hitler's invasion is something the world had hoped it would never see again. Now that Poland is conquered, all eyes turn to Great Britain to see how it will react to Germany's invasion of its ally. World War II has begun. October 1939. It's taken the German army just 36 days to defeat Poland. The world reacts with shock. Arrogant, well-trained, the Nazis marched through Warsaw streets. The world was permitted to view this display of military pomp and expected to bow before Germany's might. World War II. Peace-loving Germany showed her hand in the cold-blooded murder of Warsaw. At the Chamber of Deputies in Paris, scenes are tense. Britain and France affirm their determination to reject any German peace offers based on the conquest of Poland. Hitler must go, say they. The British, the French, had no notion of what fighting the Second World War would mean. And as a result, for the first months of the war, the British and the French sat back trying to figure out what was going to happen. The situation's tense, even as British and French troops stand facing German soldiers along the French border, the Allies are ordered not to open fire. Through field glasses, you clearly see the German lines opposite, but there was no sort of activity whatsoever taking place. For more than eight months, both sides sit tight and do nothing. We had a gun in the truck. If there were two of us, we had one gun for both of us. And we had bullets. We had 10 bullets, still packaged. And we were forbidden to open them, even to unwrap them. It's a frustrating situation for soldiers stationed along the front line. Life on the ground is very hard because of the boredom and the inactivity. An American journalist refers to this strange period as the phony war. Civilian life in France remains, to all intents and purposes, peaceful. During this period of the phony war, People had sort of a false sense of security. They sort of thought, well, uh, the, the worst hasn't happened yet, and it may be that it's not going to happen, and actually this isn't going to be a war like the last war, and it's all going to be much easier. First of all, there was a sense of tightness in the country after the war of 1914 to 1918. We were not ready for a second war. It was not a feeling that was present. We still hoped that the war would not happen, at least that the Germans would not attack France. The French believe that any German invasion will be easily resisted by a series of armed fortifications built along their border. It's called the Maginot Line. Built in the aftermath of the Great War, it's considered impenetrable. The Maginot Line was made of concrete fortifications reinforced that could take very heavy artillery bombardment. The artillery pieces in the Maginot Line were designed to pop up out of concrete encasements, fire, and then disappear back under the ground to reload. The machine guns were designed to traverse interlocking arcs of fire so that if the Germans attack, all a French soldier had to do was keep on feeding ammunition into the machine guns and keep holding down the trigger, and eventually they'd all be dead. Hidden underground is a network of tunnels connected by electric railways which allow the troops to move quickly. 
The French soldiers there are supremely confident. We felt powerful and safe, almost invincible. We were absolutely convinced we could stop them. But the Maginot has a serious flaw. The biggest problem with the Maginot Line was that it couldn't be built along the Belgian border. It was very easily bypassed by the Germans. It was designed for a very static form of war, and it rendered the Maginot Line a complete folly. Early May, 1940. The winter has passed with few incidents, but that will soon change. Hitler unleashes a series of strategic moves. His armies march into Luxembourg, the Netherlands, and Belgium. The operation is codenamed Fal Gelb, or Case Yellow. German high command considers attacking France across the flatlands of Belgium. But they know that's what the Allies expect. So Lieutenant General Erich von Manstein comes up with a daring alternative plan. Manstein says it will be unexpected, but very effective, if the German army pretends to come in through the flat bit of Belgium the way they always do, and instead sends their mass of combat power, all of their tanks, and ultimately all of their aircraft through the Ardennes forest. The problem with the plan is that the forest of Ardennes is considered just as impenetrable as the Maginot Line, but for different reasons. Undulating terrain, small winding roads and dense forest. It seems impossible for armoured units to pass through. Manstein's strategy is a huge gamble, but for Hitler, it's a risk worth taking. Berlin, spring 1940. Hitler's grand plan for an almighty German empire is underway. France and the Low Countries of Western Europe, including Belgium and the Netherlands, are in his sights. On May the 10th, Germany launches Operation Case Yellow. The German war machine strikes again. Without warning, by air, by land and water, the most terrible of all blitzkrieg so far, Nazi forces overrun neutral Holland, Belgium and Luxembourg. With Allied forces focused on northern Belgium, the Wehrmacht risks all on General von Manstein's plan. They need to achieve what's considered impossible, to pass through the dense forest of the Ardennes to the southeast. It's virtually undefended. The Nazis know that their only enemy is the forest itself. Undaunted, the mobile units press on. On May the 13th, the first panzers begin to emerge into France. Lieutenant General von Manstein's plan to bypass the Maginot Line is working. Through the green forest they rode, first the motorcycles, noisy, brutal, and fast. Then car after car. There must have been lorries full of soldiers, too. I stared out of my little corner window and saw it, hardly believing, and my heart literally sank like a stone. The Germans set their sights on the small town of Sedan a crucial objective which has a vitally important crossing point over the River Meuse. There, they catch the French completely unprepared. A bloody battle begins. The under-equipped French defenders valiantly resist. But after just two days, Sedan is almost completely destroyed and the German army crosses the River Meuse. The Wehrmacht now pushes west. French civilians attempt to escape the relentless German blitzkrieg. When the Germans cut loose with 
They are very aggressive, very focused form of warfare. People who are used to being bypassed by war, people who are refugees, people who are civilians, discovered that they were in the firing line. The refugees, they were going along, and some of them had bicycles overloaded, and some of them had carts. And as it was going along the road, the next thing was a plane came swooping down, machine gunning the, the refugees as he was going along. It was a pretty horrible thing to see. If a Messerschmitt is machine gunning a road full of refugees, there's only one reason for that, and that is sheer cruelty. When we were in low altitude flight over the roads, if cars came to meet us, we kept the headlight on. That made the driver think that there was oncoming traffic. Then we let rip with the cannon. It was a great success. The way people talk about the attack, and particularly the bombardment, is that it was the noise was terrifying. It was the combination, the, the Stuka, the sounds that they could hear. And then they knew that that was the warning for the bombardment that would come later. I was shaken to the core when, uh, when I first saw German fighter pilots machine gunning crowds on the French road, you know. And it wasn't just the bomber aircraft that were doing the strafing, it was 109s and 110s. I immediately found myself in the ditch at the side of the road in the fetal position and, and my hands over the back of my head with all the team bodies on top of me. For a Europe that had been sitting in the, the quiet of the phony war, the sight of Germans attacking civilians was shocking. As the refugees fled, a lot of people talk about how they understood the disaster much more through what they were seeing and hearing than from what they were reading or hearing on the radio, for example. Uh, I remember the French radio gave us the impression that there was a great mobile reserve held behind the left flank of the Marginaux line, and somehow or other the French would counterattack and cut off the German advancing forces. The reality is very different. The Wehrmacht is in total command. Meanwhile, back in Britain, Prime Minister Neville Chamberlain resigns on May the 10th, and the former First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, replaces him. He faces a situation that's worsening day by day. With the Low Countries under German control, all that stands between Hitler and victory in France is the British Expeditionary Force. For the British, the situation seems hopeless. They're outflanked and forced into full retreat. A German pincer movement pushes them north towards the French coast. The surrounded Allied soldiers head to the small town of Dunkirk. It's a long-standing German way of war to seek a decisive battle of annihilation. That is to encircle the enemy, then use artillery and infantry to close in on and annihilate the enemy. The Germans managed at Dunkirk to surround the British Expeditionary Force. All that remained was for German forces to fight inward destroy the British Expeditionary Force and knock Great Britain and its empire out of the war. Late May, 1940. In Dunkirk, a disaster is unfolding. Thousands of British, French and Belgian troops face annihilation. With the Wehrmacht closing in, the men digging in on the beaches come under attack from the skies. 
Luftwaffe bombs and machine gun bullets rain down. Total defeat looks inevitable. Then, with victory in sight, one of the most controversial orders of the war is given by German high command. The panzer units approaching Dunkirk are ordered to halt. General Rundstedt from the German Army Group C argued, well, we have to stop the tanks because the war is not over. And there's a second period and we have to, we are not in Paris yet and we have a lot of casualties, we have to stop, we have to give them a pause. The German high command of the army said, this is the chance to crush the British expeditionary force. And Hitler said, you know, well, I am the boss. I take a decision. And because he didn't like Halder and the German high command of the army, he supported Rundstedt and said, no, we are going to pause, we are going to halt. Though the panzers are at a standstill, the Luftwaffe continues to pound the Allied forces at Dunkirk. The port and beaches come under heavy attack. With each passing hour, the situation becomes more desperate. For the Allies, the only hope is an evacuation. May 1940. Germany's invasion of France and the Low Countries is a resounding success. The BEF and the Allied troops are trapped at the French port of Dunkirk. Back in Britain, an ambitious rescue plan is hastily put together. It's codenamed Operation Dynamo. From the British military base beneath Dover Castle, Admiral Bertram Ramsey directs the top secret operation. But he's faced with a huge problem. What the British planners very swiftly realized was that you can't just sail a destroyer right up to a beach and get loads of people off it. What Ramsey needs to evacuate the troops are as many small vessels as possible. He issues a plea for help to anyone who owns a small craft capable of crossing the English Channel. Dynamo involved this extraordinary policy of asking people to volunteer or requisitioning their little boats, you know, moored at harbours all the way along the southern coast of Britain. Hundreds answer the call. Soon, an armada of recreational boats, yachts, commercial craft and fishing vessels are ready to make the 20-mile channel crossing. May the 26th, 1940. Operation Dynamo begins. As the Royal Navy and the little ships arrive at Dunkirk, the Luftwaffe maintains their attack on the Allied forces below. We got back to Dunkirk. I ran along the, the beach. They were machine gunners again. Me and another chap both fell down. And uh, when I stood up, he had a hole in the back of his head, and uh, he was dead. When we got to Dunkirk, well, all I brought was it was burning from end to end. It was just absolute chaos. The German assault keeps coming day after day. Troops in the town, port and on the beaches try desperately to find their way to the waiting ships. The beach was black with people, from here up to the drink. So over there, the sea was full of boats and people trying to board them. During the night, we were told to go out on the mole. It was very dark, apart from the all the fires burning, there was the oil tanks burning in Dunkirk. See the ship out in the sea. We saw this other boat taken on places a little way out, so we decided to swim to that. Jonesy got on, but I went to go on, and the bloke was in charge of the boat. He wouldn't let me get on. But my mate Jonesy got on, and he said, well, if he don't come on, you go off. Under intense fire, the boats shuttle as many soldiers as possible from the beaches to Royal Navy vessels at sea. 
A destroyer came in very quickly, and we were told to jump aboard, and which everybody did. And within a few minutes, um, the thing was full, and, and off we went. Some went below, uh, some were on the deck, but everyone just collapsed and went to sleep. Woke up when I got it over. June the 10th, 1940. Operation Dynamo is complete. Admiral Ramsey had hoped to rescue around 10,000 troops. But with the help of the little ships, over 330,000 British and Allied soldiers make it back to Britain. We were put into a train, and whenever we stopped, people came up with coffee and cigarettes and this sort of thing. We had this tremendous euphoria, really, uh, quite unfounded, that, that we were some sort of heroes and we won some sort of a victory. I think the mood in the country at the time, certainly for a few weeks, was that one had deliverance. They got soldiers back, and that transcended everything else. It was obvious, really, that we'd been thoroughly beaten. Everybody realized that if they thought about it. In a way, it was a success because it was a big danger that the whole British Expeditionary Force would be, you know, defeated in France. Getting at least the soldiers back was, in the end, a success. But, of course, the original plan was to defeat the Germans and not to flee to Britain. What else should Churchill do? He must sell it as, as a victory somehow in that very difficult situation. The story of that epic withdrawal will live in history both as a glorious example of discipline and as a monument to sea power. And the Royal Navy once again achieved the miraculous and crowned the Army's gallant feat of endurance. I think there was a sense that the French felt that at Dunkirk, the British were covering their backs and abandoning them, and that here, was an example of the British perfide Albion, the British yet again uh, showing their true colors and going off and leaving the French when they most needed that help and support. For Germany, Dunkirk appears to be a great victory. Hitler seems to be fulfilling his promise to restore pride to the fatherland. Everyone was so positive already. Oh, yeah, I mean, it's so great. The whole north of France, we defeated. The British Expeditionary Force uh, is back in Britain. Uh, so great, nobody expected that. We didn't have free press at that time, so nobody really realized that there was a chance to capture more than 300,000 Allied soldiers, and this chance was lost. Arguably, the single greatest defeat faced by the Germans in the West in the Second World War is their failure to destroy the British Expeditionary Force, which enables the British and the Allies to continue fighting after 1940. With the BEF out of the way, Nazi Germany is on the verge of complete victory in France. Hitler now sets his sights on Paris. June 1940. Germany's operation in the Low Countries is a resounding success. Luxembourg, Belgium and the Netherlands have all surrendered. What remains of the British Expeditionary Force is evacuated from France. Now the second phase of the Nazi plan to capture all of France begins. Codenamed Foul Rot, or Case Red, the Wehrmacht moves west. The objective is Paris. Classic German military theory says that you should attack the enemy's king, the enemy's capital, the enemy's army. Those three things will be the keys to victory. And in the German experience, Paris 
is the key to defeating France. Parisians were relatively calm at that point. Um, most of what they'd seen conformed to what had happened during the previous war. And, you know, there was a sense of normality. However, on the 3rd of June, Paris is bombarded. And suddenly, people start to feel, we need to get out now. The first air raid of this war on Paris was made by well over 200 Nazi bombers and resulted in the death of more than 250 people, the majority of them civilians, 10 of them schoolchildren. Many hundreds were injured. Wherever the high explosive bombs fell, great destruction was caused like this. Most of these people don't really know where they're going. They just want to go somewhere away. They struggle when they can't find food or petrol. They inch down the streets. Hundreds, thousands of people become lost on the roads of the Exodus. To avoid the complete destruction of Paris, it's demilitarized and declared an open city ready to be occupied. The French government leaves. Meanwhile, to the east, the Wehrmacht continues to advance. The French army is outnumbered and overwhelmed. On June the 10th, the Germans break through at Abbeville and the French line begins to collapse. In a matter of days, the Maginot line is completely enveloped. Finally, on June the 14th, German troops march into Paris. People watch from behind their shutters. They watch as those tanks and those beautifully kempt soldiers in their shiny uniforms march into the streets of Paris. Uh, notre entrée à Paris. Our entrance into Paris was on the 14th of June, 1940, by Port Saint-Antoine. We followed the outer roads and down the Avenue des Wagrams until the Arc de Triomphe. There were not many people in the roads. There were a few people who made friendly gestures. Some turned their backs. Most Parisians stayed behind their windows and shutters. The Germans marching around the Lac de Triomphe, this was the symbol of victory. It was clear, I mean, with having captured Paris, that's it, game over. June the 16th, 1940. Refusing to support an armistice with Germany, French Prime Minister Paul Reynaud resigns. I think people are shocked and horrified at what's happened. They never imagined that, that France would suffer such an excoriating defeat, that their lives would be so completely turned upside down. So into this sense of confusion and, and trauma steps the very trusted, respected figure of Marshal Pétain. Marshal Pétain, the great First World War hero of the French army, a man of immense prestige, is seeking an honorable way for France to survive as a state and for the French to survive as a people. He reassures them, he says, we must put down our arms. And although it pains me greatly, we must stop the battle. We must ask for an armistice. June the 22nd, 1940. 
Just five days after the formal French surrender, Marshal Pétain meets Hitler at Compiègne to sign an armistice. The French government has capitulated. 22 years ago, a great Marshal of France received the surrender of the German army. Now his former colleague, another Marshal, breaking his country's solemn obligation to its allies, signs abject terms of surrender for France. The armistice is signed at the same location as the German surrender of 1918. Hitler adds to the humiliation by using the exact same railway carriage. The railway car is of tremendous symbolism to the Germans because, for a while, that's where German honor died. And when Hitler ensures that he is sitting in that very same railway car, taking a French surrender in 1940, he is symbolically trying to resurrect German honor in a twisted way, and he's also grinding the French noses in defeat. More than half of France is now under German rule. The remaining southern part of the country is a Nazi puppet state governed from the town of Vichy. Captured French soldiers will spend the rest of the war in prison camps. The effect on the French was absolutely devastating. There's no question about that. They were absolutely shattered. If ever there was a broken country, it was the French. Everywhere one went um, on that day and for days following, there were tears pouring down the faces of the French, you know. They were so desperately upset. Summer 1940. Continental Europe is now under Nazi control. Great Britain stands alone. In his famous speech delivered on June the 4th to Parliament, Winston Churchill memorably encapsulates the nation's resolve and defiance in the face of Hitler. The speech is later recorded for posterity. We shall fight on the seas and oceans. We shall fight with growing confidence and growing strength in the air. We shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight in the fields and in the streets. We shall never surrender. Great Britain is next in Hitler's crosshairs. A mere 20 miles of sea stands between the British and the all-conquering Wehrmacht. From the tops of the White Cliffs of Dover, the sound of Luftwaffe engines can be heard on the wind. The Battle of Britain is about to begin. <laughs> 